Welcome back to another episode of the Bellator Zone Preview Show. Oh, I'm so pumped for this one. This week, Bellator MMA heads back to their home office in Ankersville for their biggest card of 2022, headlined by the Dutch middleweight king, Gegard Mousasi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are going to discuss everything that is going to happen at Bellator 2A2, Musasi versus Eblen. Make no, mis- make no mistake about it. This is the biggest Bellator MMA card of the year by far. It's super stacked. Still can't believe we are getting all this action on Friday night. All right, first, let me run down the lineup of this virtual studio before we get this Bellator Zone party started. My name is Santiago, coming to you live from beautiful Amsterdam city. And I'm feeling great, not only because Real Madrid just won the Champions League, but also because of this fantastic Bellator 282 card. And as always, I'm joined by my partner in crime, Big Marcel from Eurosport. Big Marcel, good to have you back here in the Bellator zone. How excited are you about this stacked Bellator 282 card in Ankersville? Man, I'm very excited, man. But I'm even more excited about the guest we have today. I mean, she is, in my opinion, one of the best uh, MMA journalists out there, you know, and uh, I mean, she is, in my opinion, the best female journalist MMA out of there. And uh, I, I've been a fan of her for a long time. You know, she knows that as well. I always say you're great. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy we have Farah on the, on, on the Bellator show today, man. Yeah, same goes for me and Big Marcel. We were talking about Farah back in 2021, but we just couldn't get the schedule ready to have her on. Well, that's going to change today. The third person in this virtual studio is, of course, Farah Hanun from MMA Junkie, making her debut here at the Bellator Zone. Farah, such a pleasure having you on. How excited are you about this stacked Bellator 282 card? First of all, I appreciate you guys having me and I appreciate the kind words. Uh, no, it's a great card, a lot of uh, big implications, Danaway Grand Prix, a lot of exciting uh, fighters, personalities, all that good stuff. So I'm very excited. <laughs> all that good stuff. That's 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 great. Uh, we need passionate people about Bellator MMA. It sounds like you got all the passion that we need. All right, no time to waste. Let's just get right into the action. And uh, Big Marcel, we'll start like we always do, right at the top. Our fellow Dutchman, Gegard Musasi, set to defend his middleweight throne for the third time in just 10 months' time. Gegard has been very active as of late. He is, of course, coming off that big win against Austin Vanderford in Dublin. Prior to that, prior to that fight, Musasi dismantled John Salter. And on Friday night, Musasi is set to face another number one contender in Johnny Eblen. Eblen is one of the five ATT fighters to compete on Friday night's Bellator MMA card. Farah, wanted to start with you. No matter who you have on, they all love themselves some Gegard Musasi. Before we get into this up into his upcoming fight, I just want to know what you think about Gegard, his style, his current form, and his UFC departure. Do you think the UFC was wrong? To let him walk that easy? I do. I definitely do. Just because, I mean, Musasi, you can't respect, not respect his resume. One of the most underrated fighters probably in MMA history. Uh, the guy's fought and beaten the who's who. Even in the UFC before leaving, he looked so good. And I know a lot of guys tend to look at the UFC when they look at the best fighters in the world. So the new wave of fans are just not going to know how good Musasi is. And Anytime he talks about being one of the best middleweights, if they look at him being in Beltran, they're not going to give him that respect that he deserves. Uh, we're seeing, obviously, Adesanya reign supreme in the UFC and stuff. I would have loved to see Musasi against Adesanya. I would have loved to see Musasi against the top middleweights. Um, you know, the kind of the newer era past the Weidmans and the Rockholds. But listen, you know, Musasi's doing this thing here. Uh, he's only lost twice in God knows how many years uh, that, uh, you know, that come from behind loss, knockout loss through Uriah Hall fight. He was dominating. And then, the Lovato junior fight, very close loss. Uh, very, although, you know, he was kind of like dominated and controlled on the ground early on. Very impressive stuff. Just how, uh, showing how much of a veteran he is and just surviving those ground attacks and turning the fight completely around on Lovato just kind of speaks to his experience. So, yeah, I mean, he's a funny guy as well. I think it's a shame that people didn't get to see that funny side of him early on. 
Uh, he just gives you that impression that he just doesn't care. And if, if you don't know Musasi and you just listen to a random interview of his, you'd be like, oh, I'm a little bit worried. This guy doesn't sound motivated. He's talking about making money and, and he's finding all these young, hungry guys. You know, how does this guy get motivated? But that's just always how he's been. So he's a, he's a funny guy. Uh, I think he's just one of the most like underrated and underappreciated uh, fighters that we have in MMA. Yeah, I could not agree more. And this is my take, not Farah, not Big Marcel. This is my take. I think Gegard Musasi would sweep the floor with like Israel Adesanya. It would take him down, pound him out. That's a discussion for another. Santiago, next question. Hi, Gegard. It's your old pal Santiago from Amsterdam. How are you? I'm good, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Gegard, you fought at Bellator 200 in London, which was a stacked card as well. And also this Bellator 2A2 card on Friday, absolutely stacked again. And they want you to close the show. The company really values you, right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, always felt uh, treated well from the beginning. Uh, they took care of me when I was injured with the a Shemenko fight. Uh, always, uh, always felt uh, appreciated here. So I'm also very thankful, you know. We spoke to each other shortly before the Vanderford fight, and you said that attacking from the bottom was also an option, depending on how the fight develops. Is that again something that you worked on for this fight with Eblen? Yeah, I think he needs space to do ground and pound. Uh, I worked on, you know, to do damage if we get there. Uh, if I'm on the bottom, still do damage, make him work, make him want to do stuff. I don't know. I don't plan to go uh, to lay on my back. So <laughs> he's getting right back up uh, straight, uh, right away if he, if he takes me down. Gegard, a lot of people ask themselves, how is it possible for you to have such a long career already? But you are still this day on top of the game. What would you say is your biggest attribute for being this dominant for so long? Wanting to make more money. That's the thing. <laughs> You've been the best day. You've been the best day, Veel succes op Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The time, Big Marcel. Here we have another 10 and 0 guy in Eblen. Also, Vanderford was undefeated, I think, at 11 and 0 or something, before losing to Gegard in just one minute time. Do you think, Big Marcel, this is also a too big of a step up for Eblen? I mean, Musasi himself thinks so, if you listen to his interviews. What do you think, Big Marcel? I love that you don't let me reply to that, uh, that you think Musashi is beating Adesanya. Because I honestly think that Musashi would give Adesanya one of the most toughest fights he can have. You know what I mean? Because of style. Because Musashi can stand and Musashi has a good ground game as well. You know, so that's why I think so as well. So you're kind of afraid for my opinion about that. You could have just asked Santiago. Um, about this fight, yeah, man, Johnny Ablin, I mean... He got that win over John Salter last time out. And it was pretty much like if you win that fight, you have a big chance to, to get Musashi for the title. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it makes sense to me. Uh, you still have Tokov somewhere, but Tokov is not really, uh, doesn't fight too often. I know he's on this card as well, but he's fighting a, a newcomer, an unranked guy. So, you know, for me, it's like it makes sense. Uh, Ablon has looked good so far in his belt of career, but Musashi is the next level in that division, you know, so does it come too early? It's hard to say. I would say if you listen, if you look at what he has done in, in Bellator, maybe not, but if you look at the quality Musashi has, he hasn't fought a guy like Musashi yet, so maybe it comes too early, but we have to see that uh, this coming week if it comes too early, and uh, I probably can only say that after the fight, if it, uh, if it was or not. Santiago, next question. Hi, Johnny. Thank you for the time. Before we get into your fight with Gegard, I wanted to first ask you about the ATT gym. They have five fighters scheduled on the stacked Bellator 282 card. All, all very skilled fighters. How was the energy in the gym? Oh, good. Uh, the whole camp, we were all pretty hyped about this fight and uh, this fight card. And, you know, it's it's just nice to have teammates around and it's nice to have the energy at the, at the gym while we're training and while we're here, uh, you know, during fight week. You have been with the promotion since 2019, and in the first three years, you just couldn't get a ranked opponent. But after the Salter fight, things got into motion pretty quickly with now a title shot. How does it feel to get this big push from the company? Feels good. Um, I feel like I'm at where I need to be and just need to go out and execute. 
I can imagine that you watched Musasi's last fight. How do you prevent a disaster like what happened to your teammate Austin Vanderford? What do you think he could have done better or smarter? Uh, just took his time. Um, not trying to go in there to take his head off in the first. Um, Austin seemed a little nervous. Um, that's about it. You know, take your time. You got 25 minutes. What would you say, Farah? Is this a too big of a step up for Eblen? I think it is, but when you look, like Marcel said, when you look at the rankings, the fact that he's coming off of a win against Salter, it's just, it made sense. So that's kind of what's going to happen as Belt or uh, develop their middleweight division as it gets deeper and stuff like that. So I think he's definitely earned it when you look at the body of work he's done at Bellator, but Musasi is just a special case because of how experienced he is. And we're not talking about one of those like older experienced guys like Machida where maybe he's past his prime and he's taken some down. So we're talking about a very good Gegard Musasi who's still at the top of his game and still, uh, you know, performing at a high level. And I think the Vanderford fight, people will probably look at that because Vanderford was undefeated, strong grappler. And maybe people looked at uh, Musasi's fight with Lovato as, okay, it builds, surely it's going to build confidence for a standout wrestler like Eblen. And it probably did the same for Vanderford. But, you know, Musasi is very good on the ground. I mean, Lovato is next level or super high level on the ground. But the fact that he showed that composure, didn't panic, was mounted, was put into some deep chokes and kind of just, you know, stayed composed because that's Musasi. He's that skilled on the ground as well. So maybe there, people could look at that and be like, okay, strong wrestler, but, you know, cardio plays a factor, five rounds uh, experience. And uh, Evelyn's, I, I believe all his finishes have come in the first round. So it's either been first round finishes or decisions. And, uh, you know, he's just fighting a guy who's kind of seen it all in the cage. Just Can 36 years old. Gegard Musasi, big Marcel. Can I ask Farah a question? Um, for example, we're talking about Musasi and Adesanya. You don't have to give me your pick or whatever, but a matchup between the, those two, how would you see that going? And uh, what, what, what do you think in general about that matchup? I would love to see that fight just because I know, um, you know, Adesanya's wrestling gets tested all the time. I mean, people see that as the route to victory, but I do believe Musasi would stand uh, with uh, Adesanya. I mean, Whitaker first fight felt like he could stand with Adesanya ended up getting knocked out. That's why in the rematch, he changed things up and started mm -hmm. implementing his grappling. But I believe Musasi would stand. He would mix in the grappling, sure, just because it seems like that's what people look at as a chink in Adesanya's armor. But I do believe he would stand and trade uh, with Adesanya. And that's what I love about the matchup so much. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to go against Adesanya on the feet just because he's so smart. He doesn't get pulled into wars. Uh, minus Calvin Gaston, but that's because Ga Gaston was just kind of walking in and then taking those big shots. He's got an incredible chin, but usually, I mean, Adesanya can pick you apart from the outside. He doesn't care if the crowd are booing and stuff like that. If he's got to do what he's got to do, uh, but you know, Musasi mixing in that grappling. Adesanya has underrated takedown defense, so I don't think it would be that easy to take him down, but uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, Musasi's fought a light heavyweight as well, so I don't know. Like, the, the strength, I think the strength of Musasi is going to be the big question here. You know, we saw Blahovic take Arasani down, but he's a lot bigger and stronger. So I think that's the, the factor. Kind of the game plan from Musasi is what the big kind of factor for me would be. I think he would found them out, but that's just me being a Bellator homer. <laughs> Farah, another one for you. Let's just pretend Gegard Musasi wins this fight against Johnny Eblen. What would you like to see him do next? A super fight with Joel Romero, a move up to light heavyweight, or a boxing match? That's It's interesting because like, I think he's been talking about moving up to light heavyweight, so I wouldn't be opposed to that because it's sometimes it's tough to get motivated against these young guys, right? Vanderford, Eblen, nothing against them. They're fantastic fighters. Uh, both were unbeaten going into the fight with Musasi, but a guy like Musasi spot everyone. It's kind of hard, right? I mean, it's hard to not fight those big names, especially at this point in his career. He kind of deserves those big fights. Uh, Yoel Romero looked impressive in his last fight, I think, after his last performance. Maybe not after his debut, but after his last performance, uh, that would be a fun one to watch. Light heavyweight is always there. Just the, the dual champ thing is always going to add more attention and give him uh, more opportunity, more money, like he, he always talks about. I know Musasi's big on, on the big paychecks. Boxing is going to depend on his opponent because I know he said he's not interested in the Jake Pauls and whatnot. Although, you know, being a guy that loves, you know, wants a big paycheck, Jake Paul would be that guy. But I don't even think Jake Paul would be, you know, entertain that. Jake Paul is probably looking more of a bigger name where he could, uh, and a winnable fight, and Musasi doesn't exactly fit that criteria. He mentioned Anderson Silva, that would be so good, but will it sell? Will it sell to the new wave of fans and guys who don't really understand combat sports properly? I don't know. 
So I don't know about the whole boxing thing. And he's against bare knuckle as well. So I don't know about the whole boxing thing. Uh, I think a move up to, to light heavyweight or UL would probably be a better option. Yeah, I don't think Jake Paul's going to fight him. You know, Gegard is someone in his own weight class. He don't like that. He want to fight smaller guys. So I don't think the Gegard fight is going to work out. Big Marcel, just to end on this main event, because we have so many fights to go through. How proud are you, Big Marcel, that we have a Dutch champion who's striving like this in Bellator MMA. Musashi, a real role model for our country, right? Same thing goes for Rainy the Ritter. He's unfortunately not in Bellator yet. Big Marcel. You know, I'm kind of a weirdo, you know, because I'm not really like uh, always for my country. So I'm a huge fan, you know, but listen, these guys, it's important for, for Dutch MMA, you know, in general, that we have good fighters here. And for Musashi has been such a long, on a high level top guy, pretty much like Overeem as well in MMA. Overeem is not in MMA right now, he's in kickboxing. And for Rainier de Redder, yeah, I hope he makes a transition to the UFC next year, man. I think that that would be perfect. Yeah, of course, I'm happy, you know, with it. I mean, um, listen, if you ask Farah if there was an Egyptian champion in the UFC or in Bellator, she would be proud as well, you know, and it would be very, very good for, it, it's good for every country who is not like the US or Brazil with multiple champions. If you have one champion, you know, you can have, uh, you have kids who look up to those people and maybe going to train themselves and are going to train as well, you know? So it's important, you know, and uh, that that's the thing. But for me, it's like, it's not like he's from my country. I'm a huge fan, but obviously I hope the people from the country where I live in do well because it's only good for the country, you know, and for the, for the development of the sport. Heading to the co-main event of the evening. Look, I don't want to disrespect Musashi at all, but the most talked about fight on this Bellator 282 card is the co-main event. I mean, many people expect Musashi to wax Eblen in some kind of way, but all the talking is about this co-main event. And that is all because of one Danny Sabatello who takes on Leandro Higo in a bantamweight Grand Prix fight. Sabatello, of course, the second of five ATT fighters scheduled to fight on this card. An amazing co-main event we have here. Farah, wanted to start with you. The Sabatello kid is a real character, right? Do you like his style in and outside of the cage? And how far do you think he can go in this tournament? Yeah, he, he, he's an interesting guy. And it's obviously been working, him being super vocal and stuff. He ended up on Ariel's show. You know, the guy, he knows what he's doing marketing-wise. He's unapologetic. Doesn't like the Colby Covington comparison. So he is a... He's an ATT guy, a good friend of Jorge Masaros, but I do kind of see him going down a similar route to Colby Covington where maybe generally, uh, especially early on in your career when you haven't developed those hands yet, uh, wrestlers are looked at as quote-unquote boring, so you got to get people to... to it's kind of like Chael Sonnen as well. I mean, his I wouldn't categorize him as top five most entertaining fighters in the octagon, but of course outside of the octagon, yeah. So it's like sometimes guys find ways to make you watch their fights, and I think that's exactly what Sabatel is doing, just kind of being unapologetically himself. He oozes confidence, uh, but he's fighting a very scrappy guy in Leandro Higo, who's got a lot of submission wins to his name, I believe like 12 or something like that. My only concern is Higo's missed weight in his past couple of fights. Uh, weight cuts obviously tough on him. Is that going to have an effect against a, a strong wrestler who's going to look to push the pace? That's my only concern in that regard. I do think, you know, Higo's got a ton of experience. He's a very dangerous fighter, uh, so he could pose problems for a grappler like Sabatello. Uh, especially with the submission game, but just the fact that he's missed weight a, a couple of times, how much is that weight cut going to hinder him uh, with a guy that's going to try to push the pace like Sabato? Yeah, who, who even knows if he's going to make the weight? I'm not sure if you can enter the Benton weight tournament without making weight, so that's going to be a huge problem. Let's not think too much about that. And yeah, he has a nasty guillotine. I would agree with that. Big Marcel, Leandro Higo, someone with a lot of experience, what Farva just said also missed weight multiple times. This is something that really pissed off Sabatello as well, man. How does Leandro Higo get his hand raised on Friday night, Big Marcel? I think he doesn't, to be honest. You know, uh, I think, um, listen, with, with Higo, I think Higo is kind of inconsistent to me, you know? He, I think he has talent, but he's kind of inconsistent to me. And um, I, listen, man, I know you're a huge Bellator guy, but I got to say it. I feel like Bellator thought the same, and they matched him with Gallagher in the tournament, you know, and they were hoping Gallagher getting to the semis and getting another event in Dublin, you know. Um, but Gallagher got out, and now you got Sabatello. Uh, Sabatello, 
listen, we had Mike Hack on the show two months ago, and he already said Sabatello is going to win the alternate fight and he's going to be the Grand Prix champion. And listen, I wouldn't be surprised, dude. This dude's grappling is crazy. He's, he, he holds you down. Uh, he controls you and he wins, you know. Listen, Higo has to finish this fight, in my opinion, to win here. I don't see him doing that. Listen, if we hear at the end of the night, 30-25, Danny Sabatello, or it's it's five rounds, by the way, 50-43, uh, Danny Sabatello, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? So I'd, there is definitely a chance for him to win. Don't get me wrong, but I don't see it happening. I got to be honest here, man. I don't see it happening. And uh, yeah, this, it's going to be some – if Sabatello gets to the semis, we're going to get some more crazy shit from him because <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> he's going to go crazy. We all know that, but uh, it makes the tournament fun. So uh, I'm all for it, you know. Yago. Hi, Danny. Thank you for the time. There are five very talented ATT fighters scheduled on this stacked Bellator 2A2 card. How was the energy in the gym for the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it's always through the roof. You know, if you look at any card, there's going to be a bunch of ATT guys, regardless of the promotion. Um, we're just fortunate enough to have six at this venue, and it's just fucking awesome. We've been feeding off each other's energy. We're in classes. We're in practices together. We push each other. You know, ATT is a huge gym, but we're also a tight-knit group. Um, we've just really been feeding off each other's energy. You know, we all flew together down here. Uh, we've been hanging out together, and we're just going to fucking show up and show out Friday night. You know, we're looking to go six for six, but not just six for six. We're looking for six finishes, and I think we got a good chance to do it. Everybody always talks highly about your head, co head coach, Mike Brown. What is it like to strategize and to work with Mike Brown, who, of course, guided many fighters to a world championship? Yeah, Mike Brown's the best in the game. Um, he is the best MMA coach, and it's not an opinion. That's just a fact. He is my head coach. I believe in him in all my heart. You know what? I just blindly believe in him. If he were to say, go out there Friday night, fight Leandro Higo with your eyes closed, I'd say, yeah, why the fuck would I want to see? I'll do that, coach. Absolutely. You know, whatever he says, I'd do it. Um, he, he's just the best in the game. We always strategize every day. I'm always working with him every day. He's got the highest level of guys. You know, he's been through it all. He's fucking coached world champions. He's coached everybody. Um, I just believe in him so much. And with Danny Sabatello and Mike Brown together, nobody can fucking stop us. Obviously, he's going to be in my corner this fight. He'll be in my fucking corner for every fight. Um, and he's just the best there is. And the last one for me, Danny. What is the best thing that you have experienced here at Bellator MMA? Because you're really involved with the company, right? Yeah, uh, very involved. And I feel like I'm slowly becoming the face of Bellator. Uh, just the treatment with them. Everything's great with them. I'm very happy with this promotion. You know, if it were up to me, I would start with them and retire with them. I see myself staying with only them. I'd like to be loyal to them. Obviously, I could do a lot of things, but I can't tell the future. So who knows what it holds. But I love Bellator. They got the best platform. I love being on Showtime. I love fighting in that Bellator cage. Very much looking forward to it. And again, I hope I retire with Bellator. Cannot wait to see you perform again. Good luck on fight night, sir. Thank you. Salvador? So much fun. So Farah, back to you. Danny Sabatello, just 23 years old, working with uh, Mikey Brown, of course, at ATT. That's a massive combination to have when you're so young, right? And this guy, you probably heard him on the Ariel Hawani show. He just uh, pushed himself into, into the gym, you know? He wasn't even, like, invited or something, but he just went in, and now he's still there. They believe in him. He believes in himself. Uh, what, what do you think about this combination, him being in Florida? Yeah, obviously, I think it's going to be great for his career because ATT have made it a thing where they they bring in a lot of wrestlers. I know that's not exactly his case, but they bring in a lot of wrestlers to kind of help their guys in training camps. And they end up benefiting so much because they get to, you know, have some rounds with some of the best fighters. I mean, I can't I probably sit all day trying to name how many great fighters are at ATT right now. So he's getting to spar, getting to grapple, getting, because a lot of times you'll get strong wrestlers that are so confident, they're, they're unbeaten or whatnot. And then, but they're never, you know, they don't have those rounds with those top level fighters. So once they get to the upper echelon, it's kind of like a shock to them. But the good thing for those ATT guys is that they're, you know, they know where they stand training at a gym like American Top Team. So for Sabatello, this young of an age to be getting those kind of rounds at a gym like American Top Team, the fact that he loses confidence after all that kind of says something. But uh, yeah, I mean, like Marcel said, I do believe that in, in this particular matchup, it's going to be more like Higo trying to 
uh, get the finish. If he doesn't finish the fight, I think uh, Sabatello could control this fight. He has five rounds to do it, but at the same time, is five rounds uh, is his cardio going to hold up five rounds? And I guess that's a question for Sabatello too, right? Because if Higo makes him work and threatens with a lot of submissions and is able to reverse position all that, we could get a an interesting matchup here. Yeah, we're talking about Danny Sabatello, the only guy to ever have a 30-24 on the Contender Series. Farah, just to end on this call main event, let's just pretend that Danny Sabatello gets his hand raised on Friday night. His next opponent would be Rafael Stutz, who just knocked out the former champion Juan Archuleta with a vicious head kick. What do you think about Stutz since he joined Bellator MMA? And how fascinated are you about a potential Stutz versus Sabatello fight? I mean, yeah, Stotts has been such a big surprise. I mean, I've, I've always known that he's super skilled, but just seeing him against Magomed Magomedov as well, uh, the way I think that the grappling, the fact, I think he surprised a lot of people there taking his back and stuff like that. So I think Stotts is just, he's so well-rounded. Uh, and I think he's, you know, I'd favor him, honestly, over Sabatello, uh, just because he's, he's good everywhere, uh, devastating on the feet, very good grappler as well. So... Uh, yeah, it's moving. That's like looking ahead a little bit. I know Sabatello is going to go into that fight confident himself, but uh, I like Stotts. You know, I think he's. Uh, I don't know if Dark Horse is the right word. Maybe people are looking at him, but I, I like Stotts to uh, in this tournament. The third last fight on the card is another bantamweight Grand Prix fight, and it's another very interesting one. Magomed Magomedov takes on Enrique Barzola for a place in the semifinals of the Bantamweight Grand Prix. Of course, Bartzola entered the tournament through the wild cards, just like Danny Sabatello. This is another amazing matchup. Bantamweight is just so much fun. Big Marcel, wanted to start with you this time. I'm not sure who I favor in this matchup because these guys are both good men. Bartzola coming off two wins since joining Bellator MMA. He beat the former champ, Darian Caldwell and Nikita Mikhailov. Uh, very good wins, if you ask me. Magomedov just relentless with his wrestling, and he has a very high pace in his fights. How do you see this one play out, Big Marcel? Because both of them are pretty good on the ground. Do you think we will see mostly a stand-up fight here? Um, no, and by the way, I was muted. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I put on mute. I want to say something about uh, about the last one. I think the UFC slapped on Sabatello and both starts, man. I feel like Stotts, uh, remember Dana was cage side when he fought uh, Marab, and Marab got the contract, and that's his only loss, you know, he just, Dana was just at the wrong place at the wrong time for Stotts, you know, because I think Stotts really good, and same for Sabatello, man, with the contender series, but yeah, let's talk about this one, I had to get that off my chest, sorry. Um, yeah, the thing is, Enrique Barzola, I think he's underrated. You know, he's a, he's a very strong guy. He's a proven guy. He won the, won the Ultimate Fighter uh, Latin America, I think. Um, he, he has good wrestling. I also think uh, the UFC made a mistake with letting him go because I always thought he was a pretty decent guy in the division. He was probably not top 10 or whatever, but he was very decent. Uh, if you look at Magomedov, Magomedov is just a great fighter, man, overall. Um very strong on the ground. I think his stand-up is good as well. Uh, got that loss against Stotts, which was a close fight, but Stotts won uh, deservedly, in my opinion. Um, I expect I expect Magomedov to win this fight, to be really honest, man. I think Magomedov uh, knows this is pretty much his second chance to get to the title here, you know. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like he, he will do well. You know, he is... Uh, one of the few guys who made it very competitive for Piotr Jan. I know he has a win over him, but that was pretty much because Piotr Jan got the point deducted in the last minute of the fight, uh, but still made it super competitive. So, um, yeah, I, I like Magomedov a lot. Always like Magomedov, as, as you know. So, uh, yeah, I think Magomedov will win. But good fight overall. Very, very high-level fight, this one, in my opinion. Yeah, and just because we are neutral here at the Bellator Zone, I will just say that I pick Enrique Barzola. Uh, Farah, back to you. <laughs> oh, oh, you're neutral. I never, I never saw that with Musashi, dude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's my good friend. How can I do it? Also with Denise Kilot, it's not going to happen. Not anytime soon, Big Marcel. Question, Santiago. Hi, Tiger. Thank you for the time. Finally, the tournament is going to start for you. Was it nice to have a little bit more time off to get a good preparation? Uh... Привет, Тайгер. Uh, Наконец-то начинается турнир. <coughs> Тебе понравилось, что у тебя больше времени приготовиться? Uh, приветствую. Да, конечно. Чем больше времени, тем лучше. И 
это раз у меня было достаточно времени после боя восстановиться, подготовиться и 24-го готов показать шоу. Um, yes, of course. The more time you have to prepare, the better. And, um, you know, I definitely had time to prepare after my last fight and, and recoup and be able to come in and, and deliver a good show on the 24th. Is Sabit going to be in your corner for this fight? And what was your reaction when Sabit told you that he was going to retire from MMA? Да, забит у меня будет в углу. О, он как бессменный у меня, все время у меня в углу. И, ну, я знал этот о, чуть раньше, чем все. И как-то уже, конечно, незавершенные дела были у него, но я его полностью поддерживаю. То, что он решил, значит, так для него правильно, и я его поддерживаю во всем. Uh, yes, Sabit will be in my corner uh, as always. Uh, he's always in my corner. And uh, of course, I knew about uh, his retirement uh, before everybody else, so kind of had time for a while to process it. And uh, even though obviously he's still had a lot to show and uh, a lot to achieve in this sport, this is his decision and he supports him 100%. Farah, back to you. Enrique Barzola, of course, training out of AKA. He has coached Javier Mendes in his corner, like always. And lately, Bellator doesn't sign people that get, sorry, that get cut from the UFC that quickly anymore. But they did with Barzola as soon as they could. And he looked very good thus far. Do you like this signing as well for Bellator MMA, Farah? And how far do you think Barzola could reach in this tournament? Yeah, I do like that signing and could perhaps be something to do with the AKA connection. I don't know. But regardless, it's a, it's a good signing. What's interesting to me is how confident Barzola is. I mean, he spoke to MMA Junkie recently. He said, I'm going to destroy Magomed Magomedov, which I found interesting uh, just because of how good Magomedov is. Uh, I do can see it playing out on the feed just because you've got two great grapplers. But I also think we're going to see just because both guys are very confident in their game and what they do. And when you're used to kind of imposing a specific game plan, I feel like both guys are, are think that they can dominate in that regard. And he, after hearing Barzola talk and how confident he is, something tells me that he will, he probably thinks he can tangle with Magomedov on the ground. And after seeing Stotts take his back and, and do well in the grappling is dangerous. A lot of times, depending on how much footage these guys watch and how much mind, uh, how much they pay mind to these kind of things. But, you know, his confidence could have grown uh, just watching that. And I just think we're going to see some really, really fun, high-level technical scrambles on the ground. At least I hope so. Santiago, next question. Hi, Enrique. Thank you for the time. You have been for just six months with Bellator MMA, but you already made a big splash. How are you experiencing your time here? Is the company taking good care of you? Oh, the company, we are... I'm so happy with Bellator. Uh, it's true. I'm so happy with Bellator. Is coach Javier Mendes going to be in your corner for this fight? Uh, no, no. For this fight, uh, I don't have in my corner Javier Mendes because now it's too much, too much, too much busy. I have a lot of fighter. Uh, for this fight, don't have in my fight. And the last one for me, Enrique, you're coming from the UFC bantamweight division. But now you're here at Bellator MMA and they have a very stacked Bellator division themselves. Would you agree with that? Uh, sure. In this division, uh, Bellator has um, super fighters. Uh, Kyoyuriguchi, Peris, uh, Mix, uh, Magomed, Stott. Uh, Bellator have good fighter. Me, the next Bellator champion. Remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good competition for me for other fighters.
Oh, I hope so as well. That fight between Stutz and Magomedov, that was awesome. You know, Stutz with his beautiful sprawls. My God, what a fight that was. Yeah. Big Marcel, Magomedov, you already mentioned it, by the way. One of the few people who handed former UFC champion Peter Yana loss. We've only seen Magomedov not excel when he fought Stutz at Bellator 264. Stutz was, of course, the interim champion right now. What do you think Tiger learned from that experience, Big Marcel, against Stutz? And how far do you think he can reach in this tournament? Because if he gets past Enrique Bartola, it's patchy mix. That's not an impossible route to, to, to the final. You know what I mean? It's true, you know. And uh, I, I think he, he can get to the final. You know, he has a lot of, he has the quality to get there. But so have other guys in the tournament as well. You know, so for me, this, I, I love this tournament. And many people were like, why it's not, not the 16 man tournament, but the eight man. This is, I think it's amazing. You know, you got pretty much, let's say you got the best six fighters of Bellator and two, pretty much two guys who maybe hasn't been proven as much as these six guys who are in the tournament, but they are also big talented. So uh, I love it, you know, and I think I think many guys have the chance to get to the final. If they, it's also, it has also to do with how are you uh, feeling that day? You know, that's always with tournament fights, you know, and um, it has a bit, it's a big difference sometimes. Um, you know, I still think that all quarterfinals, all semifinals should be on the same day. That's my opinion. I understand that they spread it out, but that's just my opinion. Um, but yeah, I like the tournament styles. The only thing that, that of course, sucks with this tournament is that the actual champion is not in the tournament anymore, you know, and that you're pretty much fighting for an interim belt. I was talking about it, actually, uh, I, I said it on Twitter, like, what does the tournament have any sense if the champion is not in it? And then uh, that, Danny doesn't matter, I say that. Then Danny Brenner get to me and he's like, the champions still get paid champion money in the tournament, you know? So I was like, okay, then I understand that you still want to do a tournament with a belt in it. That's cool, you know? And, uh, but I'm all for it, you know? I think who doesn't love a quality tournament in MMA? I think everybody loves that. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was already, I already forgot that the, the real champion wasn't even in this tournament. So thank you for reminding me there, big Marcel. Oh, Farah, you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> Farah, just to end on this fight, Bantamweight is such an exciting division in all of MMA. And Bellator has a, <clears throat> sorry, and Bellator has a very special 135 pound division themselves. What was your reaction when you first heard that Bellator was going to roll out this Bantamweight Grand Prix? And what do you make of the tournament thus far? Because we've seen some intense fights already, right? Yeah, no, I, I love it. I know there's a, a lot of, you know, with, with Pettis being out, wild cards and all that stuff, it seemed to irk people a little bit in the beginning. But after seeing guys like Sabatel and Barzola, uh, you know, you tend to think that having a strong grappling background is going to favor you uh, in a lot of matchups and a lot of tournament styles. So, yeah, perhaps they may not have, well, Barzola definitely has experience, but maybe, you know, missing a guy like Pettis and, in terms of name value and stuff like that and him being the champion and everything. But still, I think we got very worthy replacements and it's going to show and it's shown and it's going to continue to show in my opinion. So you got to, like with these matchups, it's just, it's tough to call. I think that's the, the beauty of this Grand Prix is that a lot of these fights I look at on paper and I'm not super confident if I were making picks in any of them. I feel like they could go either way and I think that's what makes this Grand Prix fun. And uh, even though, yeah, it sucks that Pettis is not, it's going to be quite the story if Stotts ends up winning it and having to fight his teammate. I know they've talked about it before, but the fact that if Stotts, you know, had to go through an entire tournament, that fate just had it, that Pettis gets injured and they end up fighting, I think that will build it up very nicely promotion-wise. Yeah, let's not forget, they were supposed to fight in the first round of this tournament, yeah. so it was already crazy. All right, she came, she conquered, she crushed. Farah, it was such a pleasure to have you on. Two things before we let you go. First of all, can you please promise Big Marcel and all the people listening that you will at least come on one more time next year to preview another massive show with us? Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, you have my word. Uh, you are the best. And then can you please tell the people where they can find all your work, social media, MMA Junkie, and what you're up to? Yeah, sure. Uh, just uh, my name, Farah Hanoon, on Twitter. Um, yeah, mmajunkie.com you'll find my articles there uh yeah that's pretty much it and you find my interviews on on mma junkie as well yeah she's the best go uh, find that you're gonna love it go follow her to the magic magical world of mma father you're the best thank you so much for joining us i'm gonna continue with big marcel 
And uh, it's a pleasure having you on. Please come back. I hope Big Marcel didn't annoy you too much. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's uh, an yeah. ab- absolute uh, pleasure to have you on. One, one of the best in the, in the business. So thank you so much. No, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for having me on. See you next thank time. Thank you. Opening the main card is fan favorite. Iris Brennan Ward taking on Cassius Kane in the main card opener. Ward is one of the big reasons why the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville is always packed. It will not be any different on Friday night. The CT crowd loves this guy as he is someone who is not afraid to openly talk about his life. And with life, I mean his drug use and his partying routines. Those days are behind him now. And he's fully focused on fighting again. Big Marcel, Bernard Ward made his comeback in February of this year after being out for five years. He's with Bellator MMA since 2012, just 33 years old, put the beating on Brandon Bell at Bellator 274. That was at a catch weight. This time it will be at 170. This guy's quite, quite the character, right, Big Marcel? What do you make of him and his high-paced style? Yeah, man, he's fun fighter to watch, you know. Um... He's like a, a pretty much a Bellator mainstay. He has been so long with Bellator. We know he, he was uh, also going to do bare knuckle, you know, but uh, he's in Bellator, I think, since 2012 or something, like in the beginning of his career already. Um, I've been good for Bellator, you know. He's now fighting Cassius Kane. Um, yeah, I, I think, let's be honest, this fight is, is made for him to... It's, it's kind of a show showcase for him, let's be honest. You know, and they put him on the main card because he attracts a lot of people there. He's he's uh, he's, he's he's fighting in his own, uh, pretty much in his own venue. You know, people, a lot of people coming to watch him. Um, There's a fight he should win. You know, Cassius Kane. I remember him uh, earlier in his career was a big prospect. You know, when he was at Victory FC when that promotion was still going, uh, and RFA. He was he was a good fight. He was a very good fighter. But got to be honest, man. In his last five fights, he has three losses and. Uh, got two wins against guys who have a who have a negative record you know so this is a big step up for him obviously going to bellator in his first fight fighting the hometown favorite pretty much so yeah i, I think there's a tailor-made matchup for brandon ward but hey man might be wrong you never know i've been wrong before so uh yeah let's see what happens next question santiago Hi, Brennan. Thank you for the time. You never shy away from your story and everybody loves honest people. Can you yeah. feel it, Brennan, that you inspire or motivate other people as well? Because there are not a lot of athletes who openly speak about these type of problems in life. Yeah. Um, I mean, I hope so. You know, like this story, this was a big gamble, you know, letting this out, you know, really like confirming people's, you know, thoughts and suspicions about me and, yeah, man. You know, I, I was as bad as they get. I, I was bad. I was bad. You know, and if if people can draw inspiration from that, I mean, I was away from the game for almost five years, man. Just kicking around jail, kicking around rehab. You know, you know, work. You know, I would work. I would work for six months, go to rehab. Work for six months, go to rehab for a month. Work for six rehabs, go to jail for a couple months. Work for six months, go to rehab for a month. It was just like this for the last the five years was just this nonstop cycle. You know, of just getting, you know, of just getting high and just, ugh, it was just nasty, man. So, and if I can come back from it, like I said, dude, I was as bad as I was as bad as you can get. So people should draw inspiration from that. And yeah, I mean, what, you know, yeah, all right, I let my story out, big deal. You know, what I'm saying, what, are you gonna judge me? I, I could care less, man. I don't care about too many people. I got my circle of people, man. You want to judge me? Go ahead, judge me. I'm just going to be 34 years old. I'm still out in the cage. I'm fucking going to, I can beat up half this roster right now, you know? And it's like, it, you know, I, d- just draw inspiration from me. Don't judge me. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got something that, everybody has something that they could fix in their life. You know what I'm saying? So don't pick away at me, man. You know, fix yourself, you know, be inspired by me. Don't, don't judge me. I think it's a showcase fight. But just to end on this fight, Big Marcel, because we have a killer pre- prelim lineup for you as well. But what was your first reaction, Big Marcel, when you heard that Brandon Ward versus Cassius Kane is going to be on the main card and not fights like Prima Shabli, Singano, Sirinson, or heck, even Anatoly Tokov or maybe Sabah Homasi? 
Um, I, I was actually uh, uh, talking about that too, or like uh, for three minutes with with my other co-host Adam Martin. And I was like, yeah, in my opinion, Brand Primus against Alexander Shabli should be on the main card. But you pretty much say it yourself, Brandon Ward is a favorite where he fights there at that location. Many people buying tickets tickets to see Brandon Ward. So if you want to have your show opened by your local favorite. Yeah, I understand that, you know? And Brandon Worth has a story, he's a long time mainstay at Bellator. So I get that, you know, from that perspective to have him open it. But I think maybe they should extend the main card a little bit more and put like Brent Primus Chablis at the second fight of the night on the main card, you know? That would have been good. I think this fight is, in my opinion, too high level to be a prelim. You got a former champion against one of the guys who I think can be a champion. So, yeah, that, that's how I see it. But uh, I understand uh, the decision. All right. That was it for the main card. But don't go anywhere, Bellator Nation, because we are right back after the break with a hot preliminary card. Heading over to the prelims. There are so many fights to go through. And as you guys know, we really like to highlight the complete Bellator card every time we do a preview show for you guys. But... We will run through them this time quickly, with a quick pace. And it's best if we start right at the top again, Big Marcel. I'm fascinated about this matchup. Former champion Brent Primus taking on rising contender Alexander Shabli, who trains out of ATT. Big Marcel, this is an awesome prelim headliner, right? Perhaps they will bump this fight in the end to the main card. But for now, it's a prelim fight. How excited are you about this matchup, Big Marcel? And for the first big chance for Alexander Shabli to really make a name for himself. I'm very hyped for this fight, man. I think this is probably, ah, I don't want to say the best fight on the card, but it's on my top three list on the best fight of the card, you know? I mean, you got the former champion, Brand Primus, who, is, uh, who has been a good, he's a good fighter, you know? He had some bad luck against Islam Mamadov, a fight he could have got the nod in as well, you know? And uh, then Benson Henderson, a win, a unanimous decision win after that. Uh, before that, only lost to Michael Chandler right in the, in the rematch. Um, he's just a good fighter overall. I think he's very solid on the ground. He has a Google Plata win, you know, on his record. I think you were alive there back then in uh, Birmingham, it was, right? Um, he's fighting Alexander. Alexander Shabli is really one of the most badass guys in Bellator, you know. He was, uh, he was at Fight Night Global. He was at ACB. When I started to watch ACB pretty much in 2016, he was... He was a big uh, prospect back then. You know, he fought for, he didn't fall for a title, but he fought Edward Fortanian. Uh, he lost a split decision there. Um, went to Fight Nights Global, got two wins over there, and then got signed by Bellator. And Bellator is doing well, you know, but he's fighting guys he should beat, in my opinion, in Alfie Davis and Bobby King. And now he gets that step up in competition. He's fighting a former champion in Brand Primus. And if he wins this fight, I see him getting a top top three opponent even higher maybe next in this fight it depends on how he wins this fight but he has to win and I, he has to win in, in, in spectacular fashion i think if he wants to get a high level more higher level fight but uh, yeah you know you know what I, you know me hear me talking i'm huge on chablis so i expect him to do very well against brand premise although brand premise is no pushover at all no, i agree with you big marcel completely i'm very hyped about this Alexander Shabli kid. This guy is fantastic. And just like you were saying, this is one of the biggest prospects right now in the lightweight division. Big Marcel, just to end before we move on from this fight, the lightweight title finally has some clarity. Patrick Pitbull will take on Sydney Outlaw next month in Washington. How happy are you, Big Marcel, that this division finally is getting some uh, an, an opening, you know, at the top? Yeah, man, I'm happy for it. You know, it's... Uh, it, it, it's perfect. It makes sense. Um, I would love actually the 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 one who wins here to fight the uh, the the winner of that fight for the title. You know, it would be perfect. You don't think so? Uh, I'm not sure if they will uh, push Chabli that quickly. They're, they're I, I know, but what do you think? Yeah, I think I think if Chabli wins, definitely. I think for Primus, I'm not sure if he's really close to the to the title. Chabli oh, no. definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, and, and, and um, I'm just happy, you know, for this division in general. Finally, Patrick Pitbull, who won the title back in November, 
and and he's set to defend now in July. Took a while, they got it done. Big Marcel, not a prelim fight. Kat Singano returns. One of my favorite female fighters on the roster. 2-0 inside the Bellator MMA cage. And uh, but she only fights once a year. Also, I heard through the grapevine that she declined a fight with Chris Cyborg. Big Marcel, what do you think about this fight between Singano and Sorensen? Through the grapevine. Even hurry <laughs> through the grapevine. Yeah. Um, the thing for me is like, what was why would you uh get Kat Singano from the UFC if we don't match her up with Cyborg. You know what I mean? Now she's fighting again, not against Cyborg. She's fighting against Pam Sorensen. Pam Sorensen just lost to uh, Arlene Blanco, right? And uh, now Singano fights. So she's 2-0 in Bellator. Listen, man, if she wins this fight, she has to fight Cyborg next. That's what's up. You know, if Cyborg obviously uh, resigns with Bellator, because I think it was the last fight on the contract last time out, that's the fight to make. The winner of this one probably fights um, Cyborg next, in my opinion. Um, yeah, uh, I feel like Singano should win this fight, although uh, she's not getting any younger, right? I think she's already 39 right now. So, um, and the thing is, if she wants to fight Cyborg, she, she has to do it right now, in my opinion, you know, because in two years, she's 42. Or, or 41, and then in your 40s, it's getting only more tough to find Cyborg. So I want to see that fight. I hope uh, we can see that fight in the near future. And I think it's a fight for Belter to make if Singano gets past Sorensen. Question from Santiago. Hi, Kat. Thank you for the time. This featherweight division is pretty stacked. Scott Coker worked hard to bring in new big names like yourself. Do you like what they've done with it? Yeah, I mean, it's a deep pool of talent here. These girls are all tough. Everyone's game. Everyone works hard. Um, I think it's an awesome representation of what us 145-pound girls can do. Pam is also not that long signed with Bellator MMA. Did you watch her last fight against Arlene? What did you make of that performance? I did. Um, I watched that fight and, you know, it, it told me a lot as far as what I you know, uh, structured my training camp around. And, and when I watched it with my coaches, you know, it gave me a lot of feedback on things I want to work on. But I also uh, trained to expect the unexpected. So, you know, as on one hand, I I plan to fight someone that I just watched in that video. And on the other hand, I plan to fight anybody, you know. So it's, uh, you know, it was a good fight. Uh, Arlene is a badass too, and as are all of these girls at this level. So, you know, just getting ready to do my best, and that's about it. Cannot wait to see you perform again. Good luck on Fight Night, Kat. Thank you. And if Chris Cyborg resigns, of course, yeah. because Big Marcel, that is what I wanted to ask you next. Do you think Kat Singano is maybe waiting for Chris Cyborg to leave the promotion so it's easier to get to the title? I don't know, man. Maybe. But, I mean, is it? You know, not you. Yeah, probably it is because Cyborg is that dominant, you know, but I feel like if you are there and you can fight like a legend like cyborg because cyborg is a legend to me you should why not i mean you don't lose any stock if you lose to cyborg you know that's how good she is it's like the same right now with valentina and the ufc and that cyborg is in my opinion still a step ahead of that because she's the goat in my opinion for women and me but you don't lose stock against certain opponents who have been dominant for years, you know what I mean? So if Singano fights Cyborg and imagine she loses and Cyborg retires, she's still in the title picture, you know what I mean? So you don't lose any stock in my opinion. So I don't really understand it if, if that's the case, but uh, we're just uh, talking out loud, right? I don't know for sure. Definite, de definitely talking out loud. Big Marcel, one of my favorite middleweight fighters is back in action. It's Anatoly Tokov from Fedor team taking on Muhammad Abdullah, hope I'm saying that correct. Scott Coker said that if Tokov keeps winning, he's going to get a shot at Musasi at some point. Tokov had some visa issues in the past, so he couldn't fight a lot. Now he's trying to get back in the rhythm again after winning last year in his own country at Bellator 269, Johnson versus Fedor. Are you impressed by this student of Fedor, Big Marcel? And how soon do you think we can see Tokov take on someone like Gegard Musasi? The problem with Tokov is just that he doesn't fight enough. That that's that's the whole issue, you know, because he's good, you know. But 
how long he's been now in Bellator for like since 2017. And he has like five or six fights. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually not really a lot, you know. And if you look at the opponents he fought, he got Slobanko, which is a great opponent, in my opinion, a former champion, you know, and Davlat Muradov is a good a good opponent as well. But he has also guys like uh, like Francisco France. I know he is a good he has a good record, but still, and Roger Darpignan was actually from the Netherlands. I mean, those are the guys he should win, you know. And I remember he had a big well, he was in big trouble against Gerald Harris, but he turned it around and he won via a choke in the second round. So against Abdullah, it's difficult, you know, because I'm not really uh, familiar with Mohamed Abdullah, you know. Uh, I know he has a loss against Sabah Hamasi and against Dequan Townsend. So for me, it's like, this is a fight that Anatoly Toko should win and should bring him closer to a title shot against either Gegard Musasi or Johnny Eblen, you know, in the, in the future. But um, he should win this one first, you know? So uh, yeah, we'll see what's happening. Yeah, we'll definitely see. I, I have a feeling that a lot of people ducked uh, Anatoly Tokov. They tried to give him a it's bigger possible. fight. Yeah, I, that's yeah, that's just my gut feeling saying that. But coming off a fight of the year in 2021, inside the Bellator MMA cage is, of course, Saba Homasi. He takes on Mike on Mendonca in a fun welterweight fight. Homasi usually shows up to the fight with his training partner, Dustin Poirier. Big Marcel, Homasi is a ranked fighter, and we have many ranked fighters in the prelims of this stacked Bellator 282 card. Homasi is coming off a submission win, submission win against Jaleel Willis. Did you expect him to maybe fight someone ranked as well, or do you like this matchup for the ATT fighter? I think Bellator wants to keep that... Uh keep the knockout thing going submission thing with quick fights with Masi being spectacular you know and uh, if you look at Mendonca Mendonca is also a guy who always goes for a finish so I think that's why they made this fight does it really make sense no I don't think so you know ranking wise definitely not but it's a fun matchup but uh, for Sabo Masi there's a lot at stake in my opinion you know he can't lose this fight if he loses this fight he will drop down in the rankings you know and Mendonca this, this is a fight for Mendonca he has so much to gain in so it's actually, I understand, it's a fun match, fight, fun matchup, but for Sabah Homatsi, it's a really, really uh, dangerous fight, you know, but he should be able to win this one, in my opinion, but, but still dangerous fight. Yeah, I'm leaning towards Sabah Homasi as well. Well, Big Marcel, it's big fights only on this amazing Bellator 282 card. It all goes down on Friday night. Here we have another one of my favorite fighters on the roster. It's Alejandra Lara. Takes on Il Ilara Joanne. Big Marcel, Colombian Alejandra Lara is coming off two losses. Although both fights were pretty close, especially the one against Kana Watanabe. She now takes on Ilara Joanne, who's better known as Arya Stark. And she is also coming off two losses inside the Bellator MMA cage. They have somewhat of a, a similar experience level. Do you like the matchup, Big Marcel? And who do you think is going to have the upper hand in this one? I was looking if your table were mo was moving uh, <laughs> up when talking about Lara, but wasn't the case this time. Um, I feel like this fight, Lara should win. That, that's what I think. You know, I think Lara Joanne, she started very good at Bellator, but when she got uh, the better opponents, she didn't look that great. You know what I mean? And for, my, for me, Alejandra Lara, um, got to be honest, man, I was surprised her losing to Deanna Bennett. You know, last time out. But the Kana Watanabe fight is not a bad loss. You know, Kana Watanabe is a, is a solid fighter. Saw that against Keel Holtz last time out. Um, Lara should win this fight. And if she doesn't win this fight, I think she's in huge trouble, man. That she has three losses in a row and two, uh, two, uh, two unexpected losses in a row. And then she will pretty much drop. I don't think they drop her out of the rankings, but she will take a, a drop in the rankings. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I would say uh, I would say Lara should win this one, you know, but that's my opinion. I don't know how you look at it, but I think you're really happy with my with my opinion in this one. Yeah, I love your pick, and it's it's a tough ro road for uh, Alejandra Lara. She's pretty young. She's one of the younger fighters in this division, and you could see that a little bit. Uh, nevertheless, she always works hard, comes to fight. I don't think she's gonna get cut if she if she loses here. No, 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 I don't think so. No, I don't think that. But like. Uh, 
God, she better win, man. You know, this is a winnable fight for her. Let's just mm-hmm. keep it to that. I think Bellator is testing her a little bit. Like, hey, we're going to give you a winnable fight. Win, please. So we can move on with you. Um, one of the biggest prospects in all of MMA, <clears throat> I'm sorry, returns to the cage on Friday night, Big Marcel. I am, of course, talking about Cody Law, another ATT fighter on this card. They have five fighters on this card alone. So it's a big party for this massive gym located in Florida. Cody takes on James Gonzalez. Hope I'm saying that correct. Correct. Do you like what you have seen thus far from Cody Law, Big Marcel? What do you think about this matchup? Because to me, it kind of feels like a showcase fight. What do you think? Again, yes. And I, we talked about it last time with Mike Heck on it when he fought James Adcock. Why don't you give this guy a, a fight up in the rankings? You know, you can't keep giving him unranked guys. I'm no disrespect to James Gonzalez. Uh, I talked briefly with you about this one for a minute. James Gonzalez uh, fought in Ring of Combat or CFFC. I think it was CFFC against Pat Sabatini. Um, it was in 2020. Uh, James Gonzalez is a Saralongo guy. And Sabatini was on the on on the verge making the 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 step to the UFC at, at that point. He was the champion there. And Gonzalez actually won the weight class up to fight Sabatini. Everybody was like, oh, Sabatini is going to win probably. But James Gonzalez got him in the arm, arm bar, arm lock, and he broke his arm. His arm was half off, you know, and he took, the, he, he got the win. Um, so Gonzalez, he's tricky, you know. Uh, he lost his last fight against a split decision against Phil Car- Caracapa in ring combat. But to do this tricky, he can surprise, you know. But I think Cody Law should be able to win this fight. You know, Cody Law is a good talent. He's 27 years of age. So I, I would want to see him fighting a rank opponent next, you know. But don't underestimate Gonzalez. Because really, if you have, guys haven't seen that fight, Gonzalez Sabatini, watch it back. It was crazy, and it looked uh, nasty. He bro- he completely broke his arm, Sabatini, in that fight. And you know, you guys know how good Pat Sabatini is. So yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's a good win. Uh, two things, big Marcel, because we were always complaining when it came about Cody Law that first Bellator wasn't <coughs> had hadn't had him ranked. Well, that's mm-hmm. over now. The guy's ranked. The yeah. second thing that we were like critiquing a little bit is that the guy just can't get a big fight. You know, like a name, a, a real good name fight that he can. Uh, catapult himself into this featherweight division. It's not going to happen again. Um, but goddamn, I'm so high on this kid, Big Marcel. Good Lord, this guy's so good, talented. I want to see him against the top guys. It's going to happen eventually. He just want to get some experience in, probably on a low-ass contract. You don't want to fight big guys when you're on a low contract. Back in action, Big Marcel is number nine ranked lightweight in Bellator MMA, Dan Moray. Has a win over Goitiyama Uchi, although it was a close fight. He takes on Killers Mota, who's always game, in for a good fight. What do you think about this one, Big Marcel? Yeah, man, Dan Moret, he's a former UFC fighter, right? Uh, he, he came to Bellator in, uh, in 2021, fighting Goti Yamochi. Split decision where many people thought that Yamochi won the fight, you know. But the funny thing was when the ranking came, came out after that weekend, Goti Yamochi was still ranked above Dan Moret for some reason. Real weird. Last fight, uh, spot by Carlisle, the Alpha Ginger. He lost the fight, uh, Rio Naked Choke, third round. And now he's fighting Killis Moda. Um, if you look at Killis Moda, right, I, th- I think he's he's a solid fighter. You know, he's from Brazil, but uh, his battle took tenure hasn't been so great so far. He, he, he won spectacular against Mandel Nalo. I got to give him that against uh, Red Garbage. You know, he, Mandel Nalo is a really good fighter and he defeated him. He took his O away, you know, and uh, after that, loses to Derek Anderson with a head kick and to Mike Hamill's split decision. Mike Hamill loss is not a really good loss. You know, Derek Anderson, it can happen. But he has to win now against Dan Murray, I think. And uh, Dan Moret is uh, he's tough. So I don't have a pick in this one, to be really honest. I think it will be a competitive fight. Kind of leaning more against Dan Moret, but uh, yeah. It's so funny to see a number nine ranked guy <laughs> so low in the prelims, you know, but that's it's Scott, man. It's stacked, guys. Hope you're going to enjoy that, of course. Uh, we spoke about a massive featherweight prospect in Cody Law, Big Marcel. But Cody is not the only big prospect in this division. Here we have Lucas Brennan, who made his pro debut inside the Bellator MMA cage, just like AJ McKee, just like Cody Law did. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lucas Brennan is now 6-0 with Bellator MMA. Five of them wins coming by finish. 
I'm super high on this kid. His dad was also a fighter back in the days. He's guiding his son to the absolute top now. Big Marcel, Brennan takes on Johnny Soto, who in his Bellator debut defeated the previously undefeated Weber Almeida. Almeida is about to take on Dutch fighter Ilias Bulaid in August at Bellator 284. I think you broke that fight. Am I correct, Big Marcel? No, it was uh, press released, and uh, but nobody mentioned it, so I mentioned it. <laughs> All right, there you have it. Back to this fight, Big Marcel. This fight somewhat feels like a showcase fight, if you ask me. I am thinking that way because I don't see any unranked fighter at the moment beat Brennan. What do you think, Big Marcel? Yeah, man, you know, for me, this is a difference with Cody Law. You know, Cody Law is already 27 and Lucas Brennan is only 22 years of age. You know, he's still very young. So I don't have a problem with him, with them building this guy a little bit more, you know. And he's fighting Johnny Soto. And like you said, man, Johnny Soto has a win over Weber Almeida in his uh, Bellator debut, right? He lost last time against Adil Benjilani, a unanimous decision. So... It's kind of a step up in competition to me, you know. It's kind of a step up in competition uh, for Brandon here uh, to fight a guy like Johnny Soto. Although Johnny Soto four and two, that record doesn't look great, but still, you know, Brandon's twenty two years of age. I don't mind to see Brandon getting, get, getting. I don't want to say an easier fight, but getting more a showcase fight at this moment, you know. And um, I still think he he will maybe have some difficulties, you know, with uh, with Johnny Soto because Soto ain't that bad, you know, but uh, Brennan should win, you know. I think uh, he, he's a talented guy, like you said, and uh, what he showed so far in Bellator has been uh, very impressive. Uh, he got six fights, five wins uh, via, via stoppage, four, four uh, submissions, one uh, TKO win. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, this guy is amazing. Cannot wait to see him fight again. All right, Big Marcel, we almost discussed every fight that was on this card. Unfortunately, our time here at the Bellator Zone is up with Big Marcel. It costs a lot of money to have this MMA media sensation on this show. There are just, <laughs> there are just two fights that we didn't highlight. And honestly, Big Marcel, I am shocked that Canadian Mandel Nello is going to be the second fight of the night. On the other hand, we can see some serious action from the get-go. Also, Aaron Jeffrey set to make his Bellator MMA debut. Very A lot of hype behind this 29-year-old Canadian as well. He will be taking on Fabio Aguiar, 18-2 and two Fabio Aguiar. Definitely not an easy fight for someone's Bellator MMA debut. That was it from my part, guys. Thank you so much for watching our preview show. Big Marcel and I will always try to bring on the best guests possible. We won't be able to always bring you guys someone as special as Farah, but we will definitely try. Um, Big Marcel, my man, always a pleasure to have you by my side. We're going out for five weeks because Bellator is going to do one card a month now. What is your opinion on that? Please, let me, What do you think about one card a month? Listen, man, if they stack it, I have no problem with it. And maybe it's a way to go, you know? Maybe it's a way to go to make the events more... Uh, more entertaining. Uh, I would love to see Bellator do more, uh, how do you say, more promotion for these five cards. You know what I mean? If I look at Twitter, I see, I see now and then I see a tweet, but they should push it more in my opinion. You know, that's just my opinion, you know, and uh, I listen to that, I don't work for them. So it's not my, my, my job to say, but that's how I feel about it. But this card is a great card. Looking forward to it. I think uh, next card is going to be great as well. So um, yeah, looking forward to to talk about you with uh, about MMA and uh, about that. You know? Yeah, five weeks we'll be back, and then Said Soma taking on Gukan Sarikam. That's a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's a pretty good fight. That's in five weeks' time. Um, I absolutely love that Bellator is doing one card a month. They're super stacked, um, <laughs> and and, and it's 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 going to be fireworks until the end of the year. I think a lot of changes are coming in 2023, so be on the lookout for that. Big Marcel, can you please tell the people listening? Where they can find all your work and just where you're up to lately. Uh, Big Marcel24, Twitter, Instagram, it's still the same. And uh, my articles on Eurosport.nl with the mixed martial arts section. That's pretty much it. Uh, having a podcast uh, with Adam Martin, which I'm doing on Sundays now. I did on Monday and Tuesday before, but we set it to Sunday now for, for the summer. So uh, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having me again, man. Always, you know that you you are the main attraction of the Bellator zone. I always keep saying that, Big Marcel. It's a pleasure having you on. 
Dear Bellator Nation, it was an honor to have you guys with us for this preview show. Big Marcel and I will be back again next month with the lightweight title on the line at Bellator 283. And that card is also shaping up pretty nicely. Big, big thanks to Scott Coker and Danny Brenner. We see all the hard work that you guys put in this promotion. The Bellator MMA future is exciting. All right, we're out of here. Don't forget to follow your dreams, guys, because if you do so, everything will fall in place for you. Stay passionate, stay beautiful, and enjoy the fights. <laughs>